We've reached the appointed time, so we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome you to the Presidential Awards for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring. Uh, let me be the first to congratulate our 15 newest awardees. The Paisman Program is administered by the National Science Foundation on behalf of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. The NSF Director and the Deputy Director for Science and Society from OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy, are both here to congratulate you on your great achievement. In addition, we have a video expressing congratulations from several members of Congress, governors, and federal agency leaders. This is your day, a day for recognition of your many years of mentoring and of our thanks for the impact that mentoring has had on STEM education and workforce development. We begin with a welcome from Dr. Sylvia Butterfield. Dr. Sylvia Butterfield is the Acting Assistant Director of the National Science Foundation, Directed for Education and Human Resources which is devoted to providing the research foundation to develop a diverse STEM literate public and workforce ready to advance the frontiers of science and engineering for society. Dr. Butterfield has served at NSF for 20 years in roles including Deputy Assistant Director of EHR, Director of the Division of Human Resource Development and Program Director among others. Before NSF, Dr. Butterfield served as Director of Education at the National Aquarium in Baltimore and as a consultant for science education radio, youth publications, and museums. Dr. Butterfield holds a BS in biology and from Loyola University, an MS from Johns Hopkins, and a PhD in science education from Morgan State. Sylvia, thanks for coming to welcome the Paysman awardees. Thank you, Bob. Uh, good afternoon. I'm pleased to add my warm welcome and to be here among friends, colleagues, and distinguished guests where we bestow the Presidential Awards for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring. To each of the honorees, thank you for your exceptional service to the nation and congratulations. This ceremony is our way of recognizing what each of you has done to help our nation's students realize their best talents. You truly provide students with a solid foundation on which to build their future ideas and careers. As mentors and educators, collectively you've inspired and encouraged a generation of American youth to pursue science, mathematics, and engineering paths, disciplines that drive the very engine of our nation's progress. Your innovative practices and passion have achieved great results in attracting a wide range of groups to these disciplines. You've reached out broadly into the talent pool, drawing students of diverse backgrounds and diverse abilities. Diverse abilities. What's even more impressive is that you continue to mentor and inspire students during a global pandemic, which has been more challenging than anyone could ever have imagined. Undoubtedly, your efforts are an example of how mentors influence our lives. And these efforts are advancing one of the National Science Foundation's longstanding core values, bringing education to all Americans and bringing resources to those who are underserved. Ensuring equity continues to be a priority at NSF, and it's a key aspect of the vision and the research of our next two speakers, Dr. Satharaman Panchanathan and Dr. Alondra Nelson. First, I'll introduce Dr. Satharaman Panchanathan, or Dr. Panch for short, who is a computer scientist and engineer and the 15th director of the US National Science Foundation. Dr. Panch has a distinguished career in science technology engineering and education that spans more than three decades. He served as executive vice president of the Arizona State University Knowledge Enterprise, where he also founded the Center for Cognitive Ubiquitous Computing. Prior to becoming director at NSF, Dr. Pont served on the National Science Board for six years and has also served, served on and chaired numerous high level research and innovation organizations. He's a fellow of the National Academies of Inventors, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Association for Computing Machinery, and other prestigious science and engineering organizations. Dr. Ponch's scientific com contributions have advanced the areas of human-centered multimedia computing, haptic user interfaces, person-centered ubiquitous computing technologies for empowering individuals with a range of abilities. Following Dr. Ponch, you will hear from Dr. Alondra Nelson, 
the first deputy director for science and society in the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. In this role, Dr. Nelson brings social science expertise explicitly into the work of federal science and technology strategy and policy. She is also the Harold F. Linder Chair and Professor at the Institute for Advanced Study and Independent Research Center in Princeton University. From 2017 to 2021, she was president of the Social Science Research Council, which is an international research nonprofit. She was previously professor of sociology at Columbia University, where she also served as the inaugural Dean of Social Science. Dr. Nelson began her academic career on the faculty of Yale University. Dr. Nelson's major research explores science, medicine, and technology as sites of both risk and empowerment, especially for underserved and vulnerable communities. She is an acclaimed sociologist and a distinguished scholar on the intersection of science, technology, and, inequality, and social inequalities. We are so honored that Dr. Nelson is able to join us today. And now he is the director of the National Science Foundation. Dr. Ponch. Thank you so much, Sylvia. I really appreciate the kind introduction. This day is about the awardees. They are a phenomenal, phenomenal group of people. I'm so thrilled to be with every one of you today. So good afternoon to all of you. As you all know, the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring, PAE SME, is the highest national award given to recognize those who have made significant contributions to mentoring in STEM. I'm honored to be with you all today to recognize and congratulate the 15 recipients of this year's presidential awards. This award is very special. It acknowledges those who have helped enhance the participation of individuals from communities who otherwise may not have considered a STEM career or have access to opportunities needed to enter STEM education. We all know that mentoring serves an important role of enabling the transfer of knowledge from one person or a group to another and can act as a catalyst for future success. Mentoring also provides the opportunity for individuals to learn from the accomplishments of others, which can then motivate new ways of thinking. Really, you get a sense of belonging and inclusiveness. Through the sharing of knowledge, inspiration, and support, we can certainly enhance participation and increase workforce diversity across the STEM sector, which is exceedingly important. By making room from diverse viewpoints, we can not only learn from one another, but we can discover how collectively when we look and work to each other, we can achieve what is sometimes thought to be impossible. Hence, mentoring serves as a central role in enabling diversity of thought and in building a national STEM enterprise that is prepared to drive forward the frontiers of discovery and innovation for decades to come. I can tell you from my personal experience that I would not be here today without amazing mentors that I've had the privilege and the honor of having through my life who have inspired me, motivated me, and guided me throughout my career. I have to express at this moment how grateful I am to every one of them. And I can understand why everyone who has been touched by you and who will be touched by you We'll be grateful to every one of you forever, in addition to this amazing award that symbolizes the spirit that you possess. While no agency as big as NSF is, institution or organization alone can create the momentum that is needed to build a more inclusive science and engineering enterprise. The award we are here to honor all of you today represents a vital step in acknowledging the role mentoring has in expanding diversity within STEM. We all know that fostering meaning, meaningful change 
requires intense collaboration and intentional strategic actions among partners across every arena across our nation. So this year's awardees embody what it means to be a role model. They don't just inspire their mentees, but all of us who are motivated and committed to expanding opportunity across every community in the country. So I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for being here today and for all the great work that you do, which has brought you all here today with this wonderful award symbolizing your accomplishment, but what you will also do for many, many more years into the future. And I would like to congratulate all of the 15 recipients of this year's Presidential Awards for Excellence in Science, Engineering and Mathematics Mentoring on behalf of NSF. I'm truly thrilled to share this platform with an amazing person, Dr. Orlando Nelson, who was introduced earlier, the Deputy Director for Science and Society in the Office of Science, Technology and Policy. She symbolizes the spirit of what this award is about. So it's a delight to be able to share this podium with her. So over to Alandra now. Thank you so much and congratulations to all of you again. Thank you so much, Dr. Panchanathan. Um, you are an exceptional leader and colleague um, and I am so honored to be able to be your partner in this work. Honored to be here today and to recognize and congratulate the newest recipients of the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, Engineering, uh, for, for Excellence in Science, Mathematics, Engineering, and Mentoring. You are excellent. You are generous. Uh, you are really the engine of so much of what drives our nation forward, and we are so grateful to you. Earlier today, uh, we had an event with uh, uh, celebrating the International Day of Women and Girls in Science, and I had an opportunity to say a little bit about what mentors have meant in my life. Um, you and, and mentors are the people who showed people like me that curiosity could be a way of life, that asking questions could lead to a life filled with learning and discovery. Uh, this, is what, this is the power of what mentors can do. They can see us through a lens we may not be able to see ourselves through. It's a mentor who can say to us, you've got this, you can do this. Some people enter a new job, a new course of study, a new space with the confidence to say, mm, I'll work it out, I'll figure it out as I go along, or to throw in their hat no matter their experience or their qualifications. But many of us, especially women and people from marginalized communities, know what it's like to not always feel that way. We know what it's like to not quite feel entitled to that confidence at the beginning. That's where it's so helpful, so powerful, and so necessary to have a mentor in your corner. Someone to say in a moment of doubt, you do have skills, you do have the vision, you do have the background to embrace this exciting new challenge. Someone to say, of course you've got this, to help you dig in and help you take on big and ambitious things. Mentors can help break cycles and help end patterns of structural discrimination that have for too long kept women, people of color, and others from marginalized communities from thriving in science, technology, math, and engineering. The mentors we're honoring today know that those barriers are high and heavy, and if we're going to tear them down, all of us must be working and pushing together. That's why our work in OSTP has been so focused on advancing equity in the STEM workforce and in STEM education, closely working, as I said before, with our good friend and colleague, Dr. Punch, and addressing the broader systemic inequality that has held too many people back for too long. From the very start of the Biden-Harris administration, we've prioritized robust engagement with the public to help inform our actions to address inequalities of the STEM ecosystem. We know that addressing these inequalities is essential to America's global competitiveness. We know it is also the right thing to do. We're fully committed to this work and we know you are too. That's why I'm so thrilled to be with this group today. Every one of you, you excellent and award-winning mentors has demonstrated extraordinary commitment to your communities and to these broader social goals. As mentors, you have helped individuals cultivate their talents and abilities in STEM, encourage them to apply for that job, reach for that academic program, and take a bet on themselves. 
There is an awardee here whose program over the last 27 years has helped over 1,800 underrepresented students earn doctoral degrees with one program graduate who is now a university president. There is another awardee whose program has reached and inspired high school students for over two decades by giving them access to meaningful STEM-based internship opportunities. Yet another awardee is an ecologist who has offered STEM programming to incarcerated students across all of Washington State's 12 prisons. One engineer with us today has created a successful model of mentoring that other universities are replicating. Another engineer today with us has helped support undergraduates by starting a program that offers paid internships. We also have among us in this August group of mentoring awardees, an astrophysicist who has been instrumental in training graduate students who then go on to earn PhDs in astrophysics. There's also an awardee who believes mentoring starts early and recruits high school students to serve as mentors. There are two awardees who focus on mentoring STEM faculty, particularly early career faculty, with one having developed a peer coaching model. Another awardee supports a student-led program that helps senior citizens learn computer literacy skills. Mentorship can happen in opportunities like this. It can happen in public moments and it can happen in quiet moments. It often happens not out in the center stage, but behind the scenes in times of doubt and challenge. It happens over time, gradually, and over the course of sometimes lifelong trusting relationships. But the impact of a good mentor is life-changing, and the results of good mentorship can reverberate for years, decades, and generations to come. I am deeply honored to acknowledge these presidential awardees today, to congratulate you enthusiastically with our deep, deep admiration and appreciation, to thank you for your service, for your dedication, and for your commitment to helping sustain our country's most precious resource, its people. Good luck, enjoy the rest of the event. And I understand that Jim Colby, who is quite uh, the Paysman historian, will now take the mic from me. Thank you and congratulations once again. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Nelson. Uh, I guess it is an advantage uh, to be of age here because I remember the very first Paysman Award Ceremony in 1996 at the storied Mayflower Hotel in downtown Washington. And it was an honor to be there then and an extreme pleasure and honor to be here now. Uh, it falls to me to introduce a, a video, a congressional video, uh, which NSF put together. It's a montage of remarks from uh, U.S. members of the Senate, the House of Representatives, governors, and uh, uh, federal officials. And all of them have remarkable testimonials uh, to provide uh, about the Paysmem Award, mentoring, and STEM education in general. So on that note, I will turn it over uh, to uh, showing the video now. This is U.S. Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith. It's U.S. Senator Dan Sullivan. I'm Senator Tammy Duckworth. United States Senator Joe Manchin. U.S. Senator Lisa Murkowski. Hello, this is Senator Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia, and I'd like to congratulate this year's Presidential Award winners. Congratulations to all the teachers and mentors selected for the Presidential Awards for excellence in mentoring and teaching. Congratulations to the teachers and the mentors receiving this year's Presidential Awards for excellence. The teaching of science, mathematics, and engineering are key cornerstones to ensure success for this and future American generations. We are so proud of the work you're doing and your continued commitment to our students and their education during this challenging time. I commend and thank you for all the hard work you do to educate and inspire the next generation of STEM-educated youth. Your dedication to growing the next generation of America's astronauts, computer science, and cybersecurity innovators, scientists, medical researchers, and so many other important professionals is laying a strong foundation for a bright future for all of us. 
Your work is opening the doors of opportunity for students across our country. And your efforts are vital to nurturing the next generation of innovators, critical thinkers, and change makers. This is an incredibly high honor for school teachers across our great country. I applaud your devotion to instilling love of science, math, or engineering in your students and preparing them for future success. I just want to thank you for your mentorship, for your teaching abilities, for your ability to influence young people and make the world a better place. And we can't thank you enough for your hard work. To all, I say job well done. Thank you and be well. This is Congressman Alex Moody. I'm Carolyn Bordeaux, Congresswoman from Georgia's 7th District. I'm Congressman Dave Joyce. Dusty Johnson from South Dakota. I'm Congressman Jay Gills. Congressman Jimmy Raskin. Congressman Jimmy Gomez. I'm John Larson. I'm Donald McEachin. Congressman Antonio Delgado from New York's 19th Congressional District. And I just want to say congratulations to all of the exceptional teachers and mentors who have won excellence awards in science and engineering. What an honor it is for me to congratulate you teachers and your mentors on the wonderful STEM education work that you're doing. Your outstanding work is shaping the next generation of American scientists, mathematicians, engineers, securing our nation's place as a leader in science and technology. It's obviously a subject area that, uh, that is very important to uh, everybody from local to federal and worldwide. Your dedication and commitment to your students will ensure that they will have the skills necessary to compete in the global economy. I just wanted to say thanks to all our teachers. We are so proud of the great work that you do for our students day in and day out. We're extremely proud of your accomplishments and to each of you who have persevered in helping to mentor these during a very difficult year. As a former teacher, I wanted to reach out and say congratulations to this year's winners who are amazing teachers and mentors to our young people. Your dedication to your work is inspiring and noble. Know that it will make a difference for generations to come. We are so grateful for teachers and mentors like you who are bringing along the next generation of young people who are specializing in the STEM fields. STEM programs are so important in your contribution in shaping the future leaders of our great nation for fighting. Thank you for your tireless work and all that you do to educate and inspire your students. Thank you for your work as well. We're deeply grateful for all that you do to nurture those who are coming up as future leaders. To all of the recipients of this year's Presidential uh, Awards for Excellence, Thank you so much for everything that you've done, and I look forward to everything you're going to do in the future. Hi, I'm Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf. This is Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts. Governor Tony Evers here. This is Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir. I'd like to congratulate all the incredible, dedicated educators who are receiving presidential awards for excellence in science, math, and engineering mentoring and the winners of the Presidential Award for Excellence in Mathematics and Science Teaching. We know that education is the key to building a better world for all of our people. Mentors and teachers like you go above and beyond to help others succeed in the classroom and in the workplace and beyond. Thank you to all of this year's winners for all you do for the promotion and education of the STEM field. And once again, congratulations on the significant achievement. My name is Gerald Bennett, and I'm the hub liaison for Federal Interagency STEM Initiatives. I'm Janet McCabe, Deputy Administrator of the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Congratulations from NOAA. Congratulations to this year's Presidential Awardees from the United States Patent and Trademark Office. I'm thrilled to be able to be here with you today to congratulate you for your commitment to unlocking the power of STEM. By sharing your knowledge and passion and inspire the next generation of STEM experts, you are making the invisible visible. On behalf of the Department of Veterans Affairs, I want to extend our deepest thanks and appreciation for all you do as mentors and teachers to support STEM students in their future. Thank you for all you do to encourage innovation in all of our students.
that was a, uh, a great set uh, of messages. And, and they really uh, uh, show how deeply this mentoring award and program has arced across the entire federal landscape. And I would, uh, at this point, like to say just a few uh, words about the genesis of the Presidential Mentoring Award. It really has its birthplace in a 1994 document issued by the Clinton White House. And the document is called Science in the National Interest. And it's back in the days when nothing was online yet. And I am the proud holder of one of the actual printed copies in my library at my NSF office. And it was a groundbreaking document for a number of reasons, but pro foremost uh, for today's purposes, it indicated that mentoring was a key component and a key characteristic of extending excellence in the STEM workforce in both research and education. And I might add, uh, in addition to that, uh, the National Science Foundation, uh, a little known uh, fact, has about 6,000 active research and education awards that are active across the United States where mentoring is a component and characteristic of the supported project. And that really says a lot, uh, as our uh, director Panchanathan said earlier, about the power of mentoring to uh, uh, support great uh, men and women as they join not just the uh, STEM workforce, uh, but uh, in their general education uh, and, and um, uh, in their life on earth. Science and engineering is a key part of our life and mentoring is a superb way to make sure that that knowledge is pushed forward. At a glance, uh, for those of you online today, we have 15 awardees and 10 are our individuals and three are organizations and you'll see each of them in just a moment. And 60% of these mentors are of a diverse and racial ethnic background. They have a stunning 300 years of combined experience in this important activity, 22 years average for each and every one of them. They are. Uh, uh, they hold um, eleven master's degrees and nine doctoral degrees in their respective uh, science and engineering fields. They, of course, being at the top of their class, they have countless other awards and accolades and publications uh, uh, in their vitas. And lastly, the diverse mentoring activities you'll hear about today. Uh, are indicative that each one of these awardees that you'll be introduced to, they have created mentoring programs in their institutions that have been institutionalized and are now part of their organization's ongoing activities in mentoring as a sine qua non for all of either their undergraduate and graduate students people in private laboratories and organizations, the military and other federal agencies. There is great mentoring going on everywhere. And nowhere is that better exemplified than the women and men you're going to meet today. And now it's my pleasure to introduce my boss, Dr. Diana Elder. Mm -hmm. And Diana is a professor of geological sciences at Northern Arizona University. She came to the National Science Foundation in the year 2020. And she is a member of the Education Directorate senior staff. And uh, uh, I met Diana when she came to our first staff meeting and was only 30 seconds late and apologized as a quaternary scientist saying that geologists have a different uh, notion of time. And at that moment, I knew that she was the exact woman I needed to be working for. And it's, an, it's my personal pleasure to introduce to you, Dr. Diana Elder. Thank you very much, Jim. And hello to everyone. And most of all, congratulations to the honorees. It is my pleasure to introduce um, the individual honorees and then the organizational honorees. So first, Ansley Abraham. Southern Regional Education Board, Atlanta, Georgia.
Margaret Baggio. The University of, Aust of Texas at Austin, NASA Texas Space Grant Consortium, Austin, Texas. Junior Bernardin, the Ron Clark Academy, Atlanta, Georgia. Karen Berg, University of Georgia, Athens, Georgia. Minerva Cordero, the University of Texas at Arlington, Arlington, Texas. Winnie Dong, California State Polytechnic University, Pomona, Pomona, California. Cheryl Knobloch, Pennsylvania State University, University Park, Pennsylvania. Carrie Leroy, the Evergreen State College, Olympia, Washington. Mohsen Mosley, Howard University, Washington, DC. Enrico Ramirez Ruiz. I'm sorry, uh, please go back one slide. <laughs> Mohammed Kazi, Tuskegee University, Tuskegee, Alabama. Enrico Ramirez Ruiz, University of California, Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz, California. Joyce Yen, University of Washington, Seattle, Washington. It is now my pleasure to present to you the organizational honorees. California Academy of Sciences, Intern Program, California Academy of Sciences, San Francisco, California, represented by Elizabeth Babcock. Hawaii Academy of Science, Honolulu, Hawaii, represented by Amy Weintraub. The National GEM Consortium, Alexandria, Virginia, represented by Brennan Marcano. Thank you very much. And again, congratulations to all the honorees. I will now turn it over to Nafisa Owens. Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Nafisa Owens. I'm the Assistant Director for STEM Education at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our alumni speaker, uh, Dr. Calvin Mackey a lifelong resident of New Orleans, Dr. Mackey graduated from high school with low SAT scores, causing him to take special remedial classes before he was admitted to Morehouse College. However, once at Morehouse, he completed his degree in mathematics, graduating magna cum laude. While at the very same time, he also earned a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from Georgia Tech, where he then went on to earn his master's and PhD in mechanical engineering. Following graduation, he joined the faculty at Tulane where he researched heat transfer, fluid dynamics, energy efficiency, and renewable energy. In 2002, he was promoted to associate professor with tenure. And that following year, he was honored with a Paisman Award for his years of mentoring and outreach efforts to K-12 undergraduate and graduate students. Dr. Mackey, it has been almost 20 years, and I know you are no longer at Tulane. I know we only have a few minutes, but please share a little bit about where you are today and the impact of your award. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Ms. Owens, thank you for having me. 
to the White House officials and the NSF officials, thank you all for continuing this program and honoring uh, this uh, prestigious group of, of, of individuals and organizations. Uh, many of the organizations have played a role in my life. To the awardees, congratulations. I mean, this is, this is huge. It's not something to just wave your hand by. That means you have committed your life and your organization to service. And if there was ever a time in our country when we need service and service to individuals, it's now. So thank you for your effort and thank you for your commitment. Yes, Ms. Owens, I will never forget the day in 2004 when I walked out of the White House uh, after receiving my Peace Med Award. And when I walked out of that White House, I realized, I said, I know how to mentor 20, 30, or 40 people. And I challenged myself to see if I could mentor an entire community. So 2004, I received the award. 2005, uh, Hurricane Katrina hit. Uh, and some of y'all may not know, but in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, Tulane disbanded its engineering school. I was the first and only African-American ever tenured in the history of the College of Engineering at Tulane University. And overnight, I had lost a tenured position. And I seen that as a, as, as, as a sign from my creator that I should follow my heart. I was in the institution doing great research, loving what I was doing, but I used to look out the window and see the community and wonder why many of the kids in the community didn't know me or didn't know my colleagues or didn't know the great things that was happening in these institutions. So following Hurricane Katrina, I did a sabbatical at the University of Michigan. And that's when I started uh, to go to the communities and try to figure out how can we not only mentor kids in schools and mentor kids in colleges, but how do we mentor families and, and, and communities? And being a part of PEASMIT gave me the insight, but also gave me the courage and gave me the, you know, the, the wherewithal to believe that such a thing was possible. Being a part of the Peasement family, I'm able to pick up the phone now and call people all across the country who otherwise have, have, have done uh, mentoring and who are still doing mentoring and, and have these conversations. So eight years ago, I started an organization by the name of STEM NOLA. And STEM NOLA is an organization uh, to, that we created to expose and inspire and engage communities in hands-on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. When I was nine years old, my uncle bought me a, an erector set and I built a car and he ran, it ran across the floor. He jumped up and he looked at my dad and said, that boy is going to be an engineer. When I left college with low test scores in mathematics and low test scores in reading and went to Morehouse College, it was mentors at Morehouse who made me believe that I can even get a mathematics degree. It was the mentors at Morehouse who pointed me in the direction of Georgia Tech and said, if you did it here, you can do it there. And when I walked into the door at Georgia Tech, who has an amazing history of mentoring people like me, there were many individuals that led me through the way to, to make me believe that I can get a PhD when I didn't even know it know, know what it was. So this Peasmith thing for me, this presidential uh, award for mentoring in science and, and math and engineering is a part and parcel of my DNA now. Actually, it is my life. With STEM NOLA, we started in New Orleans uh, by having these big, mentoring events in a community, but now we have events upward of where we have two to 300 kids, K-12 kids showing up. We surround the K-12 kids with college kids. Then we surround the college kids with STEM professionals. So at any event that we may have in the community, we have what we call vertical mentoring now. The young kids can see themselves at different stations in life. They can see themselves maybe as college students. And then the college students can see themselves as professionals, but then the professionals get a chance to come back out and pour it back into the community. In eight years, we've engaged over 100,000 young people and 20,000 families. Due to the COVID uh, pivot, we jumped online and now we're engaging kids in 47 states and five countries. The success and benefit of engaging communities in STEM and mentoring an entire community in STEM now grows out of this award from the National Science Foundation and the White House and the Office of Science and Technology Policy. And it would be remiss if I don't say that, because sometimes we create these type of awards, we invest in people, and we never see the benefit of that investment. The White House Office of Science and Technology and Policy, the National Science Foundation poured into me, and I thank my creator now that I've had the wherewithal to pour into now hundreds of thousands of kids around the world. And I say that because I want the mentees, the, the, the award winners to know, your work is important. It was important yesterday, it's important today, 
and it's gonna be even more important going into the future. So continue to do what you are doing. Continue being an advocate, an advisor, and an ally, because in the 21st century, our children will only have three options. Our children will only be able to take something, break something, and or make something. And if they don't have mentors like you, mentors like us, it's only going to leave them with the two options that they see on the news every night. And for every kid in America, regardless of their socioeconomic background, regardless of their race or ethnicity, we want them to be able to make something, make a life, make a future, make a difference like you. Congratulations, and thank you all for having me. Dr. Bob Mays. Well, I'd like to thank Calvin for his warm welcome to our new fellow Paysman alums. These are, uh, it's great to have one of our experienced uh, uh, alums speak with the brand new uh, award winners. Uh, we thank all of you who attended this event to honor the nationally recognized mentors that we announced today. A special thanks to our national leaders from the National Science Foundation, from the Office of Science Technology Policy, from Congress, governors, and federal agencies for honoring these proceedings with the remarks to our new alums. I wanna thank all the members of the NSSE's team as well for the work they do in supporting the Paysman program. This program wouldn't happen without Yovanda, Maurice, Emily, uh, Elsa, our newest member, and Jim, our, our oldest member. Uh, we also thanks to the Booz Allen Hamilton contractor team whose support is instrumental to the EASE program. So we invite all of you to join us for the Models of Equitable STEM Excellence Symposium, which is coming up at three o'clock. The mentors honored this afternoon will share some mentoring highlights and future steps as nationally recognized mentors. A distinguished panel will share promising practices for further implementation and dissemination of mentoring models that work. Should be an exciting time. We hope that you'll join us. The panel and our new PASM awardees will also engage in a dialogue about mentoring with those experts. So come join us for the symposium at three o'clock. Our award uh, recognition is officially uh, ended. We thank the audience. Uh, we hope some of you we will see in about uh, 15 to 20 minutes uh, in the next symposium. Thank you all. Hello everyone, and welcome back to those who are joining us again as we um, restart our programming for the Presidential Awards for Excellence in, math, in Science, Mathematics, and Engineering Mentoring. Uh, again, my name is Nafisa Owens. I'm the Assistant Director for STEM Education at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. And I have the distinct honor and pleasure of bringing to our stage um, virtual stage at that, um, Dr. Alondra Nelson. Dr. Alondra Nelson serves as the inaugural Deputy Director for Science and Society within the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. In this role, she brings social science expertise, including attention to issues of social inequality, explicitly into the work of the Federal Science and Technology Strategy and Policy. She is also a Herald F. Linder, Chair and Professor at the Institute of Advanced Study and Independent Research Center in Princeton, New Jersey, a past president of the Social Science Research Council, an international research nonprofit, as well as a, professor, a former professor of sociology at Columbia University, where she was also serving as its inaugural Dean of Social Science. Dr. Nelson's research is situated at the intersection of political and social citizenship and emerging science and technology. She has a wide range of widely acclaimed publications, including most recently, The Social Life of DNA. Dr. Nelson is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Academy of Political and Social Science, and the National Academy of Medicine, to name just a few of their, her memberships as well as her, as well as her accolades. Dr. Nelson, the floor is yours. 
thank you so much, Dr. Owens, for that kind introduction. Um, let me say, uh, before I begin my remarks, uh, uh, just a, a thank you to Dr. Owens and colleagues at NSF for organizing uh, this symposium. Um, I have learned so much from Dr. Owens about STEM equity, about STEM education, about STEM workforce. Um, we are so lucky to have her working with us uh, uh, um, uh, on loan from NSF uh, on behalf of the nation to really um, improve our STEM ecosystem. It's a true honor to work with you and a pleasure every day. So as Dr. Owens said, I'm Alondra Nelson, Deputy Director for Science and Society at OSTP. I am thrilled to see all of you here and so grateful that you have joined us for this symposium this afternoon. I wanna just take a, a moment to step back and offer a bit of an overview of the day that we've had for those of you who are just joining us. Uh, it's been quite a busy and productive day, really filled to the brim with important conversations uh, and discussions about STEM equities, the STEM ecosystem, teaching and mentoring. Earlier today, uh, we hosted uh, a fascinating, illuminating event uh, jointly with the Smithsonian Institution uh, called Water Unites Us, a celebration of women and girls of color who lead in science and technology. And this was a celebration jointly of today, which is the International Day of Women and Girls in Science, and of this month, which is back Black History Month. I know so many of us walked away from that panel feeling inspired and optimistic about the achievements and leadership of women and girls of color and environmental justice uh, and the science of water quality and in space science. And then just a few minutes ago, many of us participated in an inspiring award ceremony celebrating the recent recipients of the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science, Mathematics and Engineering Mentoring. This award is the highest honor recognizing Americans who've made significant contributions to mentoring and thereby support the future productivity of the STEM workforce in the United States. This program was created to identify and recognize individuals and organizations that have led the way in mentoring and torn down barriers for people who've been structurally blocked from opportunities and the STEM disciplines and professions. We're thrilled to now continue that celebration with a symposium on models of equitable STEM excellence. We have three primary goals for our time together this afternoon. First, to convey the importance of having STEM mentoring exemplars and of widely uplifting such models to support STEM mentoring and advanced equity in STEM. Second, to provide strategies and resources to effectively disseminate, implement, and scale evidence-based and equitable practices in STEM. And third, to discuss ways to increase the use, usefulness, and impact of research and other efforts that aim to support STEM mentoring, STEM equity, and excellence in the, across the ecosystem. Today's discussions will help to inform, uh, excuse me, um, OSTP's a STEM equity strategy that we've been working very hard on and look forward to releasing later this year. Uh, but before jumping into today's panel, we'd like to take a few minutes to recognize their, uh, today's extraordinary honorees, the 15 awardees announced by President Biden earlier this week. For that, I'm pleased to hand things over to Dr. Elsa Gonzalez, Program Director at the National Science Foundation. Thank you, Dr. Nelson. I yeah, appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon. Hello, everyone. Congratulations to all our awardees. Uh, my name is Elsa Gonzalez, and I'm a program director in the Excellence Award for Science and Engineering Program at the National Science Foundation. Um, please, uh, next, uh, join us to recognize Spaceman Awardees with a video that highlights our accomplished awardees and capture the meaning behind their mentoring programs. We are so honored to share their voices. <music> My main goal of mentoring um, undergraduates is to provide them with real practice with the entire scientific process, from making observations of the natural world to designing experiments, all the way through to publishing in scientific journals with plenty of support structures along the way. The SRB Doctoral Scholars Program goal is to diversify college faculty. And we do that by building on providing mentoring, training, professional development and other support services that leads to increased 
um, PhD production and successful employment of our graduates uh, on college campuses. My mentoring program is compassion-based and my success stems from my approach to mentoring by embracing the whole person. My philosophy on mentoring is born out of my natural desire to help others and is based on my belief in the equality of human beings. Considering the high attrition rate in STEM disciplines, uh, I am gratified of the 95% uh, degree completion rate of my graduate mentees and the 100% degree completion rate of my undergraduate research mentees in mechanical engineering and their professional career and leadership achievements. The LAMAT program, uh, which LAMAT actually means star in Mayan, uh, it's dedicated to transforming the field of astronomy and astrophysics by providing opportunities for early career scientists, in particular those uh, enrolled in community college, to engage in novel research and creating healthy spaces for scientific inquiry. I'm the faculty director for the Office of Undergraduate Research at Cal Poly Pomona. We have found that students who participate in research have improved academic outcomes, including a higher likelihood of graduating. The two programs that I'm most proud of are the NASA STEM Enhancement in Earth Science High School Internship, where students are mentored by NASA subject matter experts while they're conducting authentic research, and the Liftoff Summer Institute which is a teacher professional development workshop that we host at NASA Johnson Space Center. My junior engineering mentoring program is designed to expose students to real world STEM experiences, activities, and events, but also to uncover some of the biases that are present in STEM related fields. So the students would understand the why in which they're participating in these activities and why their representation matters. My mentoring programs are focused primarily on supporting the success and advancement of STEM faculty from underrepresented and uh, minoritized groups and people uh, from the same backgrounds who are pursuing STEM faculty positions. Our mentoring program is designed to provide support to undergraduate STEM students from uh, historically underrepresented communities to promote their um, persistence in the STEM degree programs in which they're enrolled and to promote their transition to the STEM workforce. The mission of the Hawaii Academy of Science has been to promote science education in Hawaii and the Pacific. Our flagship program is the Hawaii State Science and Engineering Fair. And if we've achieved any measure of success, it's really just a reflection of the hard work of Hawaii's talented students. The Engineering Mentoring for Internship Excellence Initiative, or EMIX. EMIX is a collaborative mentoring model that partners industry and academia to support and fortify the STEM pathway. EMIX prepares women and racially underrepresented engineering and science interns for seamless transition to the professional workplace. So I'm currently developing an online research mentor module series through the National Institutes of Health, my NRNN, or the National Research Mentoring Network. I'm also working on an NIH funded program leading a, an esteem grant, which is designed to encourage underrepresented minorities to pursue advanced studies in biomedical engineering and biomedical sciences. The Careers in Science program at the California Academy of Sciences is a two to three year internship that we provide for high school uh, students from San Francisco. And these are students that are come from uh, populations that are underrepresented in the sciences. The GEM mentoring program is based off of a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, organic model that relies on an extensive 45-year-old population of thousands of alums to inform and support the next generation of the best and brightest diverse talent in STEM. my very first project at the Ron Clark Academy. My students and I collaborated with the Adopt-A-Grandparent program, where my students were allowed to teach some senior citizens how to use a computer, how to set up an email, how to also connect with the world as part of a bigger literacy project. 
I'm really proud of the Careers in Science program at the California Academy of Sciences. This longstanding program over the last 25 years has resulted in 95% of our alumni going on to get a college degree. I think the, that I'm most proud of the work that my mentees go on to do. Um, things like submitting successful NSF graduate research fellowship proposals, publishing papers, completing graduate degrees, and starting their own labs. I have been even more gratified to see my students uh, making their own discoveries and achieving high recognition in the field. I would love to leverage the network. I think it's a community of very broad thinkers, very different thinkers, and I think winning the award is licensed to do something uniquely different and perhaps out of the box. This presidential award will help us continue our work, including a newly formed coalition to support all of Hawaii's STEM programs through this pandemic and beyond. To have greater impact. The visibility of the accomplishment will allow us to attract more underrepresented minorities in STEM to our organization so that we can help guide them on their career journeys, whether that is through academia, industry, or entrepreneurship, with an ultimate eye towards creating more diversity in STEM. Congratulations again to all or, or awardees. We are so honored to be, uh, be witnessing your job, your work, your mission. Now we are gonna be joined by Dr. Car Karen Marongel. I have the honor to present Dr. Karen Marongel. She's the Chief Operating Officer for the National Science Foundation. Dr. Marongel previously served as NSF Assistant Director for the Education and Human Resource Directorate. Dr. Marongel has a distinguished record of accomplishment in research and education. She holds a professorship in mathematics and statistics at Portland State University, and she has served in several leadership roles with the Oregon University system. She has published widely in the areas of undergraduate mathematics learning and teaching and K-12 mathematics teacher professional development. Dr. Marongel holds a bachelor degree in mathematics and philosophy from Albright College, a master's degree in mathematics from Lehigh University, and a doctorate in mathematics education from the University of New Hampshire. Dr. Marongel, thank you for joining us and to serve as a moderator of this panel. Welcome. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for being here today. I'm so delighted to be able to join you all. I would like to extend my congratulations and begin by reiterating the tremendous accomplishments of the 15 awardees we are here to recognize today and the important role that mentoring plays to the STEM sector. I am delighted to join you this afternoon as we discuss the importance of mentoring and how we can better learn from best practices to enhance diversity and equity throughout STEM education and the STEM professions. We have an exciting panel ahead of us with five distinguished speakers, including Dr. Calvin Mackey, who is the founder and CEO of STEM NOLA, Dr. Becky Whaling Packard, who serves as a professor of psychology and education at Mount Holyoke College, Dr. Allison Gami, the director of division training, workforce development and diversity at the National Institute of General Medical Science, Ms. Madeline Dinono, president and CEO of the Gina Davis Institute on Gender in Media, and Dr. Gilda Barabino, who serves as president and professor at Olin College of Engineering. Our distinguished panelists will each be given a few minutes to share their introductory remarks, and then we will open the floor to questions and discussion. Dr. Mackey, I would be honored if you would start this panel by delivering your introductory remarks. Thank you, Dr. Marangel. Thank you all for having me. And again, congratulations to all of the winter, all of the winners. Uh, I'm the president and founder of an organization by the name of STEM NOLA, organization we founded eight years ago to expose and inspire and engage communities in hands-on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. I live by the quote that if we don't intentionally, deliberately, and proactively include, we intentionally exclude. A lot of times when we start talking about mentoring and we start talking about STEM, we start talking about equity, we're not 
intentional, we are not deliberate, and we are not proactive. So certain communities, especially low, low resource, low income communities get left behind. And one thing we know from the National Report Card for Technology and Engineering Literacy, uh, the National Report Card state that 63% of eighth graders say that it was either in a family or in a community that they learned how to make something, fix something, or, or figure out how things work. So early on, I realized that this STEM mentoring that we have to do as a nation has to start before the schoolroom door. It has to start in the community and it has to start with the, with the family. So eight years ago, my wife and I put up a put up $100,000 of our own money uh, to start this community-based organization where we have now uh, these large events in the community to bring the community together to expose them not only to the technical capital of STEM, but also the human capital of STEM. We built what we consider as a high-functioning STEM community. And a high-functioning STEM community is child-centered, adult-governed, elder rule. And if you can imagine three concentric circles, we focus on K-12 kids. We surround the K-12 kids with college kids, which we consider our adults in our high-functioning community. And we surround those college kids with STEM professionals. And then we call that vertical mentoring. In the last eight years, we put over $2 million in the hands of college students because we pay, we train and pay them to engage communities and families. The STEM professionals love what we do because now they have a pathway to come out and give back without it being bur burdensome on them or their company. Now many corporations are sponsoring the work that we are doing because it gives them the opportunity to put their professionals in the community, but it also gives them an opportunity to build their future workforce. For, out of the 100,000 kids that we have engaged, nearly 47% have been young women and 87% have been students that receive free and reduced, free and reduced, free and reduced lunch. So now uh, this, this ecosystem uh, that we call it is being requested all around the country. We rebranded ourselves as STEM Global Action because once we pivoted to uh, due to COVID, we began to engage kids in 47 states and five countries virtually. As a matter of fact, last month, uh, with a grant from the uh, United States, from the embassy in Tanzania, we started STEM Tanzania. We are now scaling this model. We've scaled it in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We scaled it to with Grandma State University, the HBCU in Northern Louisiana with the backing of Magic Johnson and Sodexo Magic. Uh, the first R1 institution uh, to replicate our model is the University of Illinois. We just uh, seven months ago launched STEM Illinois. And we've also uh, working out of Saginaw, Michigan now with a $3 million grant from the Department of Defense. We are now scaling the modeling and military connected communities all the way along the, the, the Gulf Coast of Louisiana, middle Louisiana, and in Shreveport, Louisiana. So our whole goal is to not only engage communities right here in New Orleans, but take this model, almost like a franchise, like a McDonald's, put it in the communities, and then give the technical assistance to those communities so that they can do what we've done in New Orleans. And in conclusion, what have we done in New Orleans? We've engaged 20,000 families, most of them low income, low resource. I have many colleagues that are now you know, in K-12 and I have many colleagues that are in higher ed, even running colleges and university now. In New Orleans, I tell my friends who are running the universities and they're running the K-12 is that we now have a way to deal with the diversity issue because the fact that we have organically brought together 20,000 families that say they're interested in STEM. Anytime an institution is having a STEM program, we now can send those parents and those kids the information and drive them to those type of programs. So if a university is in New Orleans and they have a summer camp, or if they have a Saturday program and it's not diverse, it's not because the diversity wasn't there, it's because they did not want the diversity. And that's what we're trying to do, build a anchoring organization in every city to support the education apparatus so we can touch kids from cradle to career. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mackey. Uh, such important uh, points there. Um, it's not because of the diversity is not there. Uh, thank you so much for the work that you do and thank you for being here today. Um, and uh, now I will turn it uh, over to Dr. Packard. Thank you so, so much for having me and congratulations to everyone. 
So I'm a scholar of mentoring and I focus on STEM mentoring and equity in my, re in my research. I'm also a first generation college graduate and I grew up in a working class biracial family and I went to the University of Michigan for my undergrad and I just wanted to share that I was a fortunate participant in their summer research opportunity program which was designed for first generation college students and students of color and I had an incredible experience and a mentor who changed my life a lot like the work that you're doing. And this um, is important because I went on to get my PhD and I was also recognized with the Presidential Award for Scientists and Engineers and it's a really remarkable story in one way. Um, and I'd say over the last 25 years I've reflected on that experience in my research about the vital role that mentoring programs play in our landscape and a little bit picking off of what Dr. Mackey said in some ways, mentoring programs, they're so important, they're so vital because they're so impactful, and yet they can create an exclusive club of those who are recipients and participants and those who are outside of those mentoring structures. And so a lot of what I've looked at is how we try to become inclusive, broaden our participation, but actually we restrict access and become exclusive in who gets access to those programs. So in a lot of the work I do is I try to take apart and study what are those essential functions of mentoring and are there ways that we can embed that in our daily work. So our classroom interactions, our advising interactions, our faculty development efforts, and in the workplace more generally. And so I thought I might just share an example. Um, one of the projects I've worked on now for a number of years with my colleagues in computer science we um, took a look and we um, had had some successful computer science mentoring programs on our campus and we wanted to spread this to all introductory CS students. So we invested in a peer mentoring solution where we were preparing uh, peer mentors both to be technologically sound in their peer code review and also in their inclusive practice. And those peer mentors were embedded in the introductory sequence. So all of the students were gaining access to regular feedback and encouragement. Um, and it, we saw really amazing results from that project, which was supported by a Google Capacity Grant. Um, Google asked us to put some of those materials online so that other colleges and universities could use the materials and expand the programs to other campuses, which we did. And much to our surprise, um, sort of feeling a little bit like we had had some success, uh, Microsoft came across the materials and actually wanted to disseminate them further. They wanted to repurpose them, repackage them, reinvent them a bit, and use them for a mentoring program where their engineers would be mentoring a thousand students a semester, college students around the globe. Um, and also embed it in their onboarding for new employees. So it's now available and free on their Learn platform and also through a set of YouTube videos that we created that are mentoring conversation starters. Perhaps most compelling is a student in Mexico, a young man who is studying computer science there and he has been running mentoring sessions for students all over Latin America. 5,000 students tune in to his sessions using the materials that we had created. And that's how many students want to be part of this solution, this mentoring solution. And so I think one, one thing I hope we talk about is how sometimes we have to let go of our original vision and, and share and collaborate and maybe we create something even more compelling. Um, the other thing I, want, I hope we'll talk about today is all of our efforts to scale mentoring will not bring us to equity alone. And that's because we still have so many toxins in our STEM mentoring ecosystem. And we need to work to reduce those toxins. And those include people, they include inequitable resource allocations, and inequitable policies that need to be revised. And so I think that those work together. So a lot of the work for me, mentoring and equity go hand in hand. And that's both the work that all of you are so committed and me too are so committed to doing. And we can't let that excellent work be undermined and undone by others in our system. And so I'm hoping we'll get to talk about that. Thanks so much for having me.
Thank you so much, Dr. Packard, and, and thank you for the uh, the incredible and influential work that you do in this area. Um, and yes, I do hope that we will have uh, more conversation today about those toxins that are in our system. Uh, next up, Dr. Gami, the floor is now yours. Oh, great. Thanks so much. Um, really appreciate the chance to speak with everyone. And I don't want to take up too much time because I really am looking forward to the conversation and the questions um, that'll be coming in. But I just want to share um, that I, it is such a thrill to hear all of the wonderful things going on. And what I, when I came to NIH about six or so years ago, the role was to support people like you who are just doing amazing work and to support the students who are so so in need of your, your help and support. So um, I just wanna highlight a few things that NIH is doing, but um, I don't, I, I don't wanna just give you a laundry list, but I sort of wanna put them in buckets. Um, so one obviously is um, we, we fund training grants and we have those that are specifically diversity enhancing. And the goal of that is to increase representation. And they, uh, they start as early as the pre-K to 12, all the way up through um, faculty development. And so if there is an area of interest of yours, um, please reach out to us. We can find a, a program that is specific to your um, student population. Another thing that we support, and it was great just to hear about research on mentoring, because that's one of the things we've really been committed to in recent years, is to uh, the science of mentorship and mentoring and um, to really provide a strong evidence base. Everybody here is convinced of the value of it and has a deep understanding of what's needed, but we really have to reach the broader um, scientific community and they don't have the same intuition that you do and the same <laughs> um, sense of what works and doesn't work. And so we really need to provide an evidence base and something that will, um, again, if we're talking about scaling, um, it, and, you know, not every, people sometimes don't move until they see the evidence. So it's really key that we're supporting research in this area and um, providing a strong evidence base. Um, another area of interest, and I think this is really key, is that threaded throughout all of our funding announcements that have to do with training is the key of mentorship. Um, we, I think it's acknowledged that, that research is somehow valued. Um, sometimes teaching is also awarded and given awards and, and recognized in tenure and promotion, but mentorship really is one of those things that we all know is key, but it isn't, it isn't always part of the tenure and promotion package. It isn't always, uh, there isn't always mentor training for faculty, for um, students. Uh, it's, it's, it, it, there's an assumption that you just come in with those skills and know what you're doing. And so um, we really try to put, we're trying to put language in the funding announcements and the scored review criteria to say how important mentoring is and how important it is that faculty members and individuals who are interacting with students have training. Um, and additionally, that there's oversight of the mentor-mentee match. And um, there can be people, there can be good mentors, but a bad match. <laughs> and so um, it's just, it's always good to be keeping an eye out for things. So I don't want to um, go on too long, but I, I do hope that you know that NIH is very serious about um, mentoring. You heard about the National Research Mentoring Network as one example um, of the areas that we're funding. But um, I just just to get the message out, and if you if you have any need for additional resources, and uh, please reach out to me or or um, someone at NIH, and we'll try to um, support the great work that you're doing. Thank you, Dr. Gami, um, both for your service at NIH and for the excellent information about the many ways in which NIH supports mentoring activities. Uh, next, I'd like to turn to Ms. Dinono. Thank you, Dr. Morganell. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that I am currently on the traditional lands of the Chumash peoples. I wanna recognize that we are all connected, although virtually, with one another and that the ground beneath my feet is historically the home of indigenous peoples. I wanna thank the White House and OTSP for inviting me to join you and of course, Giant congratulations to all the awardees and a special shout out to our partner, Dr. Minerva Cordero, who is an AAAS If Then Ambassador and her statue will be featured at the Smithsonian If Then She Can exhibit 
that was announced this morning. So the Institute's theory of change is, if she can see it, she can be it, that by creating opportunities for girls to see what is possible for them, we can increase their ability to see themselves engaged and pursuing unique and unstereotyped education, activities, and career paths like STEM. So how do we do this? Well, storytelling is a very popular medium that can greatly influence how we perceive our value in society and be a window into the world of career opportunities like STEM. However, our research shows that there are very few women and girls featured in STEM jobs in TV and film. In partnership with Lyda Hill Philanthropies, our 2018 research study portray her representations of women STEM characters in media found that media portrayals of STEM characters in the US send the profoundly negative message that STEM professions are just for men. And among STEM characters, male characters outnumber female characters two to one. We coupled these findings with a survey of girls and young women to see how they view STEM. And we found that girls see STEM as having gender bias and not being family flexible, which has discouraged them from pursuing STEM professions. But we have evidence of the impact when we do see fictional female characters in STEM careers. Our survey found that media role models coupled with support from friends, mentors and family greatly increased the likelihood that girls will go into STEM. When we asked what fictional characters inspired you to pursue a STEM education or career, fictional characters like Doc McStuffins and Meredith Grey on Grey's Anatomy and April Sexton from Chicago Med. Another great example is with our investigation on the power of the Dana Scully character from the X-Files, which you all probably remember, which we affectionately call the Scully Effect. And we conducted a survey of thousands of women and girls who watched the show. And 63% of the women in STEM fields familiar with the X-Files cited Dana Scully as a role model. And 50% said because of her character, it increased their interest in STEM, and encouraging their children to pursue STEM education. Let's face it, by 2029, the U.S. will need to fill over 10 million more STEM jobs. Currently, women make up half of the total U.S. college-educated workforce of nearly 60 million workers, but represent only 30 percent of the professionals in science and engineering jobs. Black and Hispanic women each make up only 2% and indigenous women only 1%. From the perspective of global innovation, we are at a disadvantage when half of our population's greatest minds don't participate in STEM in order to attract more girls in STEM, we need to tackle these stereotypes that girls are exposed to early on, whether it be from popular media or from a lack of early age role models, mentors, and influencers, which can play a major role. There's not one solution to such a complex issue, but I believe in leveraging the power of the collective impact of entertainment and media, along with STEM sectors, which can harness all of these resources to create new opportunities that we can accelerate progress and close this gender gap in inequity forever. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Donano. And your perspective is so interesting as we think about role models, media, influencers, um, and your important message that there is not just one solution. Thank you so much. Um, and lastly, I would like to invite Dr. Barabino to deliver her remarks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Morganell, and my congratulations to our outstanding awardees. I think I just start uh, and just share a little bit about my own philosophy on an approach to mentoring, because it's heavily shaped by my early experiences in the academy, pretty much in solo status. For example, starting out as the first African American admitted to my graduate program, and the first African American hired into my department as a new faculty member. As I got started, I relied on my own resourcefulness, seeking out others who looked like me or didn't, whether in my discipline or not. 
and trying to learn from the social science literature on mentoring. And over the course of my career as a faculty member and as an administrator, I helped create mentoring programs at the institutional level and at the national level. And one of the things I learned to focus on was the mentoring relationship. I view mentoring as a relational process that evolves over time in phases within a contextual setting. And I view mentoring as a mutually empowering relationship where both parties learn and benefit. And that's a definition espoused by mentoring scholar, Stacy Blake Beard. In my own approach, I thought it was very important to share my experiences with my mentees and to treat them as co-learners on a shared journey. And of course, I asked them to share their experiences as we learn from one another. I also found it was very important that goal congruity matters. So if we want to improve mentorship and draw in more women and underrepresented minorities in STEM and medicine, I think it's important for us to take advantage of this goal congruity between mentors and mentees, particularly for communal groups, like this idea of giving back to community, collaboration, and helping others. It is well documented that when the mentees view and experience STEM and medicine fields as a means of fulfilling their communal goals, they're more attracted to the field and they're more likely to remain. And likewise, they're drawn to mentors whose goals are aligned with theirs. I know from my own experience, some of my strongest mentoring relationships have been with mentees with whom I share communal goals, such as research in sickle cell disease. I'd also like to say more about the importance of context. So we should examine our research and laboratory environments, our classroom environments as places of enactment for identity formation as a scientist or engineer and for socialization into our disciplines and our professions. We clearly need inclusive environments that support mentoring relationships. And just think if the environment is hostile to the mentor, it will certainly spill over to the mentee experience. And I'd like to end with talking a bit more and giving some examples about how important it is for us to share our stories and our experiences if we want to broaden our approach and get others more engaged in the power of mentoring. So one example would be uh, a, one of my mentees and I, we co-authored a chapter and the title of our chapter was Moving Beyond the Heroic Journey Myth, a look at the unique experiences of black women in academic engineering. And we talk specifically about our own experiences as a mentor and mentee pair. And this chapter was published in the book, Mentoring Diverse Leaders, Creating Change for People, Processes and Paradigms, as co-edited by Audrey Murrell and Stacy Blake Beard. And another, Couple examples are some activities under the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. So uh, another mentee and I, we participated on a panel that was hosted by the academies and it was called Mentoring and Advising of Black Students in Science, Engineering and Medicine. It's a workshop. And during this panel, there were several mentor-mentee pairs that actually talked about their experiences and what brought them together and the uh, impact that it had on their careers, both for the mentor and the mentee. And in another case, uh, uh, Academy's activity as well, the science of effective mentoring and STEM in medicine. It's a consensus study report, and it's also a series of podcasts that speak specifically to the mentoring experiences focusing on those of women and underrepresented minorities. So focusing on this mentoring relationship as a mutually reinforcing relationship within and the organizational context, it's really important that we move forward and think about how helpful this is in the mentor and mentee training relationship and the impact on careers. So I end by saying I really do urge us to share those stories about our experiences 
especially in ways that it could have a broader impact in impacting others who are interested in supporting us and those who want to join us as well. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Barabino, and thank you for sharing some of your story and personal journey today. And thank you for encouraging all of us to do the same. I would like to now open the floor to questions and discussion with our distinguished guests. Please simply raise your virtual hand and remember to unmute yourself before you speak, or if you'd like, um, you may also enter some questions into the chat. And as you're thinking about your questions, um, I will begin with one that I have myself. Um, many of you spoke to this in your opening remarks, uh, but for those who didn't, or and for those who did, if you want to expand on some of these, what are some of the challenges that you see in why practices we see occurring in successful mentoring programs aren't more broadly used? Uh, and Becky, I know you talked about this uh, in terms of the toxic environment, so perhaps you can. Uh, start us off with saying a bit more about that, but I am I'm very interested in hearing uh, from, from others on the panel uh, around this question of why those practices aren't more broadly used. I'm happy to, to just lead off just very briefly and then um, cede the floor. I do think um, just in general, though, there is a sense of um, a finite number of resources, which is factual, right? But it's interesting when you talk about opening up mentoring, the sense that, oh, we don't have money for that, or we can't direct resources to that, but we do direct resources to other things. So I do think there is also a values assessment about whether we enact the values, which I know my colleagues are talking about um, on this panel, and where we put our resource allocations. And so thinking about it from that standpoint. And I think the other part is that um, we all have unique mentoring experiences and there are plenty of folks who have not had good mentoring experiences or have not had mentoring and can believe then that maybe other people shouldn't have them either or don't need them. And I think there still is a little bit of um, what worked for me versus maybe looking at some of that literature that Dr. Barabino pointed us to and others did too, that the fact that the National Academies had a consensus study walks us through that concrete literature and recommendations. I wish more people were reading that literature in the way that we would read literature in our own fields and take it seriously, because there is the literature there to guide us. Other panelists, feel free to join in. And I see that we but we also have some hands up, but if anyone else wants to, uh, on the panel wants to address this question, please, please do so. I, I, I would pick. add something quickly. I, I do feel like sometimes we make it much more complicated than what it is. And we act like if there's not a program, we can't do something. So like, why don't we just be civil to one another, like one human being to another? Uh, it, people sometimes feel like, well, I don't know what to say if that person doesn't share my background. What would you say if they did share your background? Like why, why, why is it always that level of complication? Why can't we just have a scientific discourse regardless of our background? Why can't that be the commonality that brings us together? So I, I do think it's worth stating sometimes that we make it more complicated than what it is. And thank you, Gilda. And, and I like to add, sometimes it's just about it's the, DNA, the DNA and culture of the environment. Uh, many a times we say young women can't become scientists and engineers because they haven't experienced one or seen one, or the same thing with minorities. A lot of times in the academy, many people who was there before I got there, they never experienced mentoring, or they claim they never had it before. So the environment was one where somebody pushed them in the end of the pool and went to the other end of the pool and they made it, and they think that's the way it's supposed to be. That's inside the academy. I was there 12 years as a professor at Tulane University, first and only African-American ever tenured. And I ran up against that the whole time. No one was there to mentor me, nor did I have an environment that was supportive of me mentoring. Uh, because one, it took away from me doing research, and two, no one understood why it was important. Outside the academy, it's pretty much the same thing, right? So you go into communities, and if there are families and communities 
or that's not representative in STEM, they don't think their kids can do STEM. So we have to change the mindset, not only in the institution, but in the community to what's possible and what should be delivered so that the people can achieve what they need to achieve. Thank you. I'm going to turn to some of the questions. This is fantastic. Um, first, I'm going to turn to Carrie, but I just want to acknowledge that I see Elizabeth Jr. and Margaret's hands um, and Cheryl's hand just went up. Um, so Carrie, if you start and then panelists, just, uh, just chime in to answer these questions. Carrie, over to you. Great, thank you. My question um, speaks to some things that several of you mentioned. First, Dr. Mackey, you said, if we don't intentionally include, then we exclude. And Dr. Packard talked about breaking down the exclusive club of mentoring. And then Dr. Barabino talked about how we can um, create more inclusive environments. My question is um, one that I think any of us who teach in higher ed might have wondered ourselves, but how can we dismantle the, the weed out courses in STEM, right? We all know they're there. Um, gen bio, gen chem, sometimes math. Um, where I teach at a small liberal arts college, our classes are small enough that we can work to support every one of our students to succeed in those courses, but how can we do that at a broader scale in these really big classes at the university level? I'm just looking for ideas. Thanks. Well, I'll step in and say one thing that I think is important is our leaders. We need to have some leadership in this space and say, what are we doing? If we accept students, they sure. clearly can do it. <laughs> So why are they, we then putting obstacles in their way? So I think there needs to be some leadership around challenging, what are we doing with those weed out courses? First of all, name them for what they are and then say, why are we doing this? And what are other ways of addressing needs? Because part of what we say is we wanna make sure that people have the skills, but are there other ways to gain the skills? And are we like setting up a structure where we're not helping them gain the skills and it's our fault, not their fault. So I think that would help some accountability. And we say, wait, it is our fault. Why are we not making this such that it's working? And how do we need to readjust? Maybe we change those courses such, such that they are not weed out courses. Uh, Carrie, you, you, you said the word, and I use the word a lot, intentionality. Uh, we have to be intentional about things. And that comes from the leadership. Uh, like Gilda said, you know, if you admit the student, then what make you think the kid, the kid can't make it? You really need to evaluate your program if the kids that you're bringing in are failing out of the classes that you are offering those kids. I, last week, I spoke at the National Council of Teachers of Mathematics, and I got a similar question. And I brought it back to sports. Today, they announced that the SEC divided $777 million between each one of their schools each school received $54 million from television contracts from football. And they asked me about, you know, black males and mathematics. And I said, well, at LSU and most of the SEC schools, they know how to keep black males in school. They know how to build uh, uh, wraparound services and learning communities and give them tutors and give them all the support they need because they value what they bring to the institution. So when I say it's intentionality, it seemed like people don't value what other students bring to the institution because they're not doing for them what they're doing for other people. Yeah, and just um, gonna chime in, hopefully this, I just switched my mic, so hopefully this is working. Um, just that point about how we arrange our spaces is so great to hear also the leaders here, the people who are in leadership positions to think about what we value and are we equipping faculty with the right spaces. So I, um, I'm also at a small college, but I have traveled to lots of places and I wanna see, you know, at Florida International University, you know, they have a lot of students there, thousands and thousands of students, but the way they equip the classrooms, now maybe not every single one, but there are some models of big, huge lecture halls, but they have whiteboards all along and people are potted in little groups. So there are ways of doing it, but you have to equip folks to do it successfully. The other part I push people on when they say, well, what would happen if everyone did succeed? We couldn't manage it. And I say, well, who's getting weeded out? Disaggregate your data and show me who, and are you comfortable with 
the same historically exclu excluded groups getting weeded out. So it's like, there's not room for them. There's room for other people. So this is also part of when you sort of push on that. It's, it's um, I do feel for faculty because there are, the, the classes are often bursting at the seams. And it's very hard to think about how to do this effectively in very large um, institutions. But I would say that I have seen it happen and there is this alignment that um, my colleagues are saying that there has to be some support and infrastructure put in place. And there's some arrangement you can do by clustering students so that there is some sense of kind of an internal group so that students are not hunting and looking. And we often see you know, community college transfers, first gens, commuters who are left out of those groups. And certainly, of course, Black and Latinx and other students who can be excluded from those groups. So it's not a, a surefire thing to just put people into groups, but there are some things we can do to make it less solitary. Thank you. Great question, Carrie. Thank you so much and congratulations to you. Elizabeth. Um, thank you so much, panelists. Uh, my question kind of goes back to the original topic when we were talking about all of the amazing research um, that's done on mentoring science and Coming from an org, I work at a museum, aquarium, planetarium, uh, and also science research institution. But uh, for those of us who work more out in communities and work a lot with youth development organizations at the community-based level, they're entirely unaware that there's actually uh, research literature um, that could be translated into practice suggestions. And I guess I'd love to direct, I don't know if any of the panelists want to reflect on either some suggestions how I might help bridge that gap between um, the research and then practice, or if there are examples um, to give about where you've seen that, that bridging, because most of the practitioners don't have any connection to the academy at all, as in, as in um, the you know, universities or research literature on mentoring science. Thank you. Great question, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Like to take that one? <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, Karen. No, I'll please. take it because that is the exact work that I do. I mean, that is that is my life's work. Uh, and Gilda and I and others have had this conversation. I've been either blessed or cursed to either been in the academy and now outside the academy. And what our work has been able to do is to marry, to serve in that gap between the formal institutions and I call it, it the non-formal institutions. We have formal, informal, and I've even talked about non-formal. So a lot of the literature uh, at STEM NOLA in our ecosystem, we are taking that literature and putting it in what I like to say, plain speak and plain talk and training people to carry it out. So you definitely pointed out there's language. There's a language that the academy uses that serves as a barrier to people in informal and non-formal spaces such that they can't get it. And I think we need more of that, right? We need almost a National Science Foundation or somebody to even uh, support almost like the translation of this knowledge uh, to uh, uh, popular science, okay? So I write for STEM for Forbes and I write about that, but I write, I write about this stuff, but I write it in plain terms that people that wanna do the work can do it and understand it. So you, you're, you're exactly on point. And I'd be more than happy to talk to you offline. Thanks, and I think just to build on that also, just recognizing that there's some resources needed as in funding um, in, in order to, to do that work. So that's a role that I think a lot of the federal agencies um, could also play. And Madeline, did you have any perspective that you could that you would like to add to this? Well, I think there's a lot of key points that have been made in terms of you know, storytelling, mentoring, role models. And from where we sit, uh, we believe the power in pop medium, popular culture, to really help, first of all, introduce and particularly underserved communities and girls that may not even imagine that something could be possible for them, but they see it in the world of make-believe and it intrigues them. Uh, and, and we believe that that has to be a factor when you particularly think, and, and particularly in, in COVID, uh, look how much streaming has exploded and where as parents, we didn't let our kids get screen time. They're getting all the screen time they want in the world. So when you think about consumption 
and how much time our children are engaging you know, with media, there's a tremendous opportunity to leverage you know, the world of make-believe to expose you know, girls in underserved communities to you know, STEM opportunities, STEM education. And, and that's really what we have found you know, has worked. A lot of the other very complicated uh, issues that are being brought up about, well, what happens when they get there? How do you keep them from dropping out uh, in terms of you know, the education? And that's really where, um, as Calvin had mentioned and others, you really need to make sure there's this ecosystem of support around them. Thank you. Thanks for the great question, Elizabeth, and congratulations to you. Junior, the floor is yours. I think we're having trouble hearing you. No. Okay, well, yeah, we'll look for your question in the chat. <laughs> Thanks, Junior. Margaret, over to you. So um, one of the programs that I have is a high school mentoring program where 10th and 11th grade students from across the nation uh, may apply to become a NASA intern for the summer. They are mentored by NASA subject matter experts and we scaffold that. So we have the NASA subject matter experts we also have peer mentors and we have some classroom teachers that are assisting those students. And then former interns, which are alumni, then come back to talk to the students about their career path and what they've gone on to major in in college. About 90% of our students have gone on to college and 60% of them are underrepresented and underserved. I'm interested in the scaffolding of mentorship and also ideas for peer mentoring. Allison, I'm wondering if you can start us off on this one and some of the work that you've seen at NIH and, and in your personal experience. Yeah, I think it's a really great question and it's, a, it's an important thing to um, focus on. I, I, we have a lot of concern about um, transitions and critical transitions. And um, as you know, a, a student can be part of an amazing program with a set of mentors, a great oversight, and they, they make that transition to the next step. And, um, you know, they're lost because of an experience or um, so. So we're, we, have to, we have a lot of bridging programs that will kind of go across the bridge <laughs> with um, support on both sides. Um, I think that um, we, we also part of the National Research Mentoring Network, we encouraged applications um, specifically on mentorship, but also navigating critical transition points. Um, I think it is a really important issue. And I think um, those of us who have mentored students and you know, even if we try to keep in touch with them, it's a, it's different as they move on, and um, they they really face some some big challenges, and you're not there to to fully support them. So I think we need to understand more, and we need to to build a lot into the system. So I'll give you one example of a of a bridging program that we just launched. It's called Mosaic. Um, this is to address the issue that we've seen of a. Uh, a 12-fold increase in PhDs in the biomedical sciences, but if you look at the faculty hires, it's really pretty much almost flatlined. It really, there has not been the 12-fold increase in, in faculty um, positions. And so we have a program called Mosaic, which goes across the postdoc to um, faculty transition. It's an award on both sides. So they're mentored side as a postdoc, but then when they go off to do their faculty job, they have a research grant that comes with them. But importantly, there's a, a program, there's an overarching program where they come together as a cohort. There's additional um, mentoring from outside um, individuals and um, it's, they're run by scientific societies so they can be connected with other scientists in their field. 
Um, and it's really with this idea that, that navigating these critical transition points is really key. So the more we can do in that space, I think, and also just encouraging programs, you have this amazing program, you're ultimately going to be measured your success on how well your students do ultimately. And how do you continue to make sure they're gonna be successful as you go out? So it's a great question. I'm sorry that was a long answer, but I mean, really hit an important point. Thank really. you. Great question, Margaret. Thank you so much and congratulations to you. Thank you. Junior, do you wanna give it another try? All right, can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, was, I literally just started typing and I was, uh, I was trying to, wasn't sure we were, we were gonna be able to get in. So um, so I recently I've been struggling with something I feel like that has been trending and I'm kind of trying to watch the data and see how everything unfolds. But um, I'm looking at the retention of black men and Hispanic men in uh, STEM related fields in colleges. And I know, no, for you know, for example, definitely at Florida State, um, there have been a there's been a decline. There are a lot of programs that they're putting in place to try to keep um, young black men in pretty much in school, like in college, and with a lot of efforts being placed with like you know girls who code, women who code, women in technology, and so forth. All these there there are lots of programs that that I'm noticing flourishing and doing some really great work. So I'm now becoming worried that black men are just being grouped with the majority when they fall under that um, minority perspective of the blacks, blacks, women, and uh, Hispanics um, who serve as underrepresented. So I'm worried about young black men and young Hispanic men falling into this, what I call the void of just being grouped with the majority and not getting necessarily the same level of opportunity and programming to help increase their presence in STEM related fields. And I wanted to see whether any of you all had any ideas or takes on what you all have been seeing, especially on the collegiate level. Great question, Junior. Anyone who would like to weigh in on this one? I'll take a shot. Now, now Junior, you talk about, I used to be the, the chair of the Commission on the Social Status of Black Boys and Black Men for the state of Louisiana. So to be able to do the work that I'm doing now, I have this experience from the academy in STEM as a PhD in engineering, all this research on Black boys and men, and now the community work. And we just submitted a proposal to NSF for INCLUDES to try to create a, a national organization for the for the mentoring of black males, black and Hispanic males, black, brown, and Hispanic males in STEM, because some of my colleagues see the same thing. But the work that we are doing, and, and your, your, your question is personal to me because I started college in remedial reading developmental mathematics. I mean, I am one of those black boys who wouldn't have been there if I would have been left to be with, with everybody else. So, so, so my work is personal. And they're just things, that's why I brought up the whole example about wraparound services. We have to be more intentional about who needs to help and give them the help that they need. Uh, and there was a day and time when I was coming through, when they had organizations like NAMIPA and, and Jim uh, and Howard Adams, who I believe won the first PSMIT, was one of the first winners, who made it intentional and deliberate that we had role models to speak to us, who we can touch, feel, uh, and be vulnerable to, to let us know that we can make it in these environments. So many of my colleagues and I are trying to bring those things back together. Uh, even with my funding model, I went to corporate America. We are sustainable. We built a model that's sustainable because some of the government funding won't allow you to do some of the things that's necessary, but I can get private funding and be intentional and deliberate about the groups that, that, that need to be saved and need, need, need to be won. So for example, even at the community level, we have mother-daughter spa day where mothers and daughters come together and do chemistry you know, by making facial stuff. And then we have father Sundays or things that, 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 two, that a man and, and a son would wanna do. So we're intentional about uh, exposing people to people and exposing people to things. And that gotta happen again on a college level. I see Marcus, Marcus Huggins on here and he knew when we was coming through school, it was very intentional. And that's why we're here today. Thank you. And thank you for the great question, Junior. Congratulations to you. Um, I, 
I'm, as you can tell, I'm picking up the pace a little bit. I love that there are so many hands up. So I want to, I want to try to get to everyone's questions. Cheryl, you're up next. Thank you. And thank you to our esteemed panelists. I was fascinated listening to your descriptions of your passionate work. Congratulations to um, the fellow awardees on the call. Um, I would like to switch gears a little bit in some of the conversation, which is captivating, but there's something that is deeply troubling me that I think with all the great minds on this call, even if we leave this call with the seed, I think this is an action item. Um, so I'll start with my question, and then I'd like to provide two examples, and then I'm all ears what you'd like to share. My work is deeply rooted specifically in engineering and computer science at a Big Ten institution. Um, I work with multiple levels of preparation from pre-college, undergraduate, graduate, and career. So my question is, we spend so many resources and abundant time, energy, all of the things in our mentoring, um, programming, innovations, um, everything. But what can we do to build a culture that is prepared to accept our mentees so that they can thrive? I'm talking about a culture of inclusion and allyship, whether it's in a higher education culture, or in a workplace, a professional career culture. And my two examples are this. Just in short, I, I can take a year worth of effort, identify mentors, educate the mentors, prepare them, build the program, populate the program with undergraduate women. I identified and resonated with a lot of the points that so many of you um, discussed from personal and professional experience. Um, and they are flying high. They're at the absolute top of their game when they lead my program. And they spend one week in a classroom that does not have the allyship and that inclusion kind of a culture ready to accept them. And, and there's just not enough there to support. Back to, I think what Dr. Packard was saying, talking about um, where are we with the, these are bad words to me, weed out courses. I'm an engineer, so I think that they're really fundamental. We need to embrace them. They may be challenging, but um, that is, those are leaving points. So if we don't create a culture where everyone is welcome, then are we really putting our resources in the right place? We need to spread them between the mentoring and creating this classroom culture that's dynamic and accepting as well. I live my preach, my two undergraduate courses, I have gender balance design teams and what a difference that makes. My other example briefly is I have a mentoring program that has that partnership between higher education and industry. And I send my mentees into the pathway, into their internships, but I could have put all these resources into them Perhaps I'm starting to think I should build a program for my industry partners to prepare them with this important theory and practice of allyship and inclusion. So they're ready to help my mentees thrive in the workplace. So the question is, what do the panelists and or others on the call um, have professional thoughts around creating cultures that embrace our mentoring programs around allyship and inclusion? I would like to take that I, I one. Have a theory. I have a theory. I have, I have a theory about why we're not doing better, even though we have these programs. Part of, part of the idea is like, so we've got these cultures and environments, but there's so many invisible hidden practices, behaviors that nobody's willing to call them out. So if you don't call it out, how are you ever gonna fix it? So how are you gonna, so you can say what you think is an inclusive culture. But then if you allow these behaviors and practices to go unnamed and unchallenged, it doesn't matter how many programs you have. It doesn't matter that you get the person all set up so they're all ready and they've got all these skills and then you dump them in these environments where we don't do anything about it. So what's, it, what's invisible? The kind of weed out gatekeeping that we've already talked about. What else is invisible? We don't even talk about the kinds of advantages that people have who, when they are in the in-group 
And I, I refer to it as this invisible hand that kind of taps them on the shoulder, like your turn, you know, like, let me open that door for you. Let me put out the carpet for you. So we don't talk about those invisible things. We don't talk about things of like not getting credit for doing diversity work. That's invisible. Nobody talks about that. It's in the literature now where they say cultural tax. But if we don't like name it, say that's what it is, it just stays under the surface. It just continues. And that keeps us from having these kinds of inclusive environments that we claim we want. So, so part of what I'm saying is some of this stuff that continues to stay invisible, we need to make it visible, name it, and then say that we're gonna do something about it so that these cultures will be more supportive. Just was gonna chime in as well and say, um, actually a recent uh, a project that we're doing right now funded by NSF that's led by Dr. Baranda Montgomery at Michigan State and Joy Mondisa at University of Michigan in engineering, really looking at these STEM mentoring ecosystems, working with institutional teams, whether they're making connections between their faculty leaving the campus and students leaving those weed out courses, you know, are those folks even in conversation with one another? And how much is our DEI or, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion work at all intersecting with that the STEM practice or the STEM mentoring? So sometimes they are these siloed and disconnected conversations and actually, in a lot of the work I've done, when you meet with different campuses and different stakeholders, including deans, sometimes they will say, I see these numbers. I see the campus climate numbers. And I see that some groups are unhappy or dissatisfied, but I don't really know what, what I'm supposed to do about that. And I think that people need to understand there's a connection between the way you teach your class, the way you walk past somebody in the hallway and look at them or don't, um, you know, those kinds of the treatment. And I'm just wondering, you know, how do we demand better from our industry partners if we're sending people to industry or our graduate school partners, which I know that, um, you know, there's great work that's being done that Dr. Gammy talked about, that there is that change, but it's still a little bit, um, you know, not as consistent as we would like it. And the last thing I'll say is the mentoring we did with the, those mentors, the software engineers at Microsoft, it was amazing, I have to say, because many of them said we went to the most elite schools. We have never had these conversations. This was never part of our curriculum. And I know that that may be different at Olin, that may be different at other places, but in a lot of spaces right now to get those elite jobs at the most elite institutions, this is not a fundamental part of their STEM education, learning how to talk to each other, create inclusive spaces, you know, how to treat people with respect, share airtime, um, you know, value people, you know, it's, there's some things that we still have to kind of bring people on board with, in addition to some of the rooting out of and naming and calling out. So there's a bit of bringing people in and changing some of the way that we teach what we count as curriculum. So many important points here. And I, I just, I can't help myself. So I would just add that in addition to to naming and calling out, that goes hand in hand with oftentimes a needing to convince. Um, and that can be hard work. Um, so thank you, Cheryl. What a what a what a great question and congratulations to you. Enrico. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here and to share the stage with these wonderful individuals. Uh, I, I wanted to highlight, you know, for me. A lot of the work that we're doing here is really to creating scientific excellence. And I think it's very clear that if not every single voice is on the table, we're never going to be truly scientifically excellent. And we have a huge issue catalyzing all the talent that we have in this country. Uh, and I think this resonates with all of us. And I wanted to ask, particularly in this stage, you know, how can we actually alter the incentive structure that we have to really incentivize culture change? And for me, you know, it has to do with funding, the funding structures, elevating the work, uh, creating measures of accountability for mentoring practices when funding is actually provided, uh, and making sure that there's a significant amount of funding uh, to the efforts that we are all doing. I think we all can relate about really fighting the system to get resources to do the work that we have been doing. Uh, and at some point, we have to elevate this work to the same stage that our colleagues want to be involved because 
ultimately that's how you get funded that's how you do the best science and 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 so my question is you know we have to be incredibly intentional to change the currency of value in stem and for me making sure that the human capital is completely and fully catalyzed is essential for the success of this nation and if we don't do it in a very intentional way uh, we're not going to be able to compete I can, I can try to jump in on that one. I think it's an excellent point. Um, one of the things that's starting to work its way through the system at NIH and certainly at NIGMS in particular, all of our research project grant funding announcements, um, we're calling for a plan to enhance diverse perspectives. And um, it, it speaks exactly to your point that you can't have excellence without um, diverse perspectives. And there's a variety in ways in which that is addressed, but one is raised race, ethnicity, but um, also institutional backgrounds and geographical diversity, you know, the whole spectrum of diversity. Um, but I 100% agree that until we change the incentive structure, we're not going to see um, big changes. And the, what I think, I believe that most people are good hearted <laughs> and that they want to do the right thing, but they're super busy and they're, they're worried about getting their grant renewed or getting their paper submitted or that, you know, and they have all of these things um, that are, are on their um, attention. And so we have to incentivize it. And one of the things that we've done, I, I think I mentioned, but in, for example, in our training grants, we put language around um, mentoring. We put language around how you excellence in training requires diversity and requires um, you know, a diversity of, of faculty, a diversity of students. Um, and so, and this, and it, it's in the scored review criteria. So when it comes time, you know, when it, uh, the reviewers are looking at it, um, a program will go down if they really aren't paying attention to this, um, including things around specifically around mentorship. So, and then on the other side, you want to um, provide funds to develop um, develop in this area. So we have administrative supplements to our training grants for developing training modules for safe and inclusive research environments. Um, we have a funding announcement that will have a training module that will be available to the broader community around issues of um, safe and inclusive environments. So we have to both incentivize the research and the activity, but at the other side, I think we have to I don't want to use the word punish, but <laughs> we should not continue to fund individuals or centers or places that that create these toxic environments. I think I heard the word toxic used earlier, and I would agree with that as well. So I think you you raise if we want big change, you have to you have to look at the money. I mean, that's um, part of the reason why I came to NIH. If you want a bigger bring about big changes, you have to, you have to um, follow the money, so to speak, unfortunately. But. Such a great question, Enrico. Thank you for, thank you for asking that. Um, and congratulations to you. Ansley. Thank you, Karen. Uh, very quickly, thank all of you, uh, you panelists for your great and insightful uh, comments and insights. I appreciate that very much. Uh, two things. One, I had an epiphany here listening to Gilda. Uh, not too many times I have epiphanies, but when she was talking, it was like listening to myself describe how I view um, mentoring, how I define it. I, I mean, guilty, but I mean, it was like listening to me talk. And I awesome. it, it went to you said, well, but I've been talking to Stacy and I realized I've been talking to Stacy for 20 some years and her views, have, <laughs> they've obviously They've obviously become my views of how mentoring's defined over the time, all, over these many years. Uh, so that was that was very insightful, and I appreciate that. Um, but very quickly for all of you, um, and you've all danced around it a, a little bit on this and about incentivizing things and making change. But we all know that everybody shouldn't be in the position of being quote unquote a mentor. <laughs> they just shouldn't do it. And what should what should we, what should school, what, how should we do, what should we do in higher ed to try to govern that? How do we measure it? What do we do to make sure some people never get close? I, it's kind of funny to say that don't get too close to a student because they do, they do damage. And I mean, I see a lot of what is 
what, what I would call, I have to do a lot of damage control from people who should not be in a position of, I would say even advising or mentoring students because they're doing a lot of damage. Did you have, do you all have any ideas, insights that what we can be doing within institutions to measure and keep some faculty away from engaging students on a very personal level? Yeah, I mean, that's a tough one. Uh, one of the things that, again, that we put in our training funding announcements was we require a plan for how they will handle um, situation when an individual shows poor mentorship qualities. I forget the exact language, but the idea there was it was it will happen. It's going to happen. So <laughs> have a plan. So what is, you know, what are the procedures and policies that are in place? And that also signals that we don't want to see mentors on that training program plan if, if they have um, a poor record or poor mentorship qualities. The exact mechanics of that, um, I would, you know, it's, I, I think it's got to be institution by institution, um, and I welcome other people's perspectives on this, but um, I think it takes, and again, it's that sort of um, uh, courage to say that this matters and that, um, you know, we, we try to make it a little easier because they can say, we'll lose our training grant if, you know, otherwise. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, I'd welcome perspectives of individuals who are having to deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think you raise an excellent point is that there are people who, um, who exhibit extremely poor qualities of mentorship and it does students real harm. Absolutely agree. Well, in general, I think I think you're right, Allison, to say courage. But if we would just have like variable models in terms of who does what and variable responsibilities, if you're good at X, OK, let's double down on that. If you're not good at don't do it because we're harming people. And I, this idea that everybody could do everything. I mean, just think about this, even in the academy, we, we when we say our pillars of scholarship teaching and service, everybody's not gonna be able to do everything well. And so let's just own up to it and tell the truth and then have the expectations more align and be more realistic with what people can actually do. And importantly, it's come up before about the reward system, but reward the people who are doing good mentoring, reward them and don't make it such that it's such a add on or that it detracts, you know, like I think that we can definitely adjust our recognition and, and uh, reward systems, but it does take courage because you need courageous leadership to just make sure that happens. Back to Calvin's point, some intentionality, but also some accountability. Such an excellent question. Oh, sorry. May I add, add something, Karen? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the, the great Lynn Preston uh, passed away a couple of years ago, but Lynn used to run the engineering centers for NSF. And she and I had a conversation uh, when I was doing my sabbatical at Michigan, and we talked about the same things, right? And I brought it up around broadening uh, participation. There should be some standardized ways that we can standardize what good mentoring is and what it isn't. And, and provide a report card. And after some point in time, the institution have to say, you're a great researcher, but we can't allow you to be near students. Now, you, maybe you can hire people or whatever, but uh, people have a history of, of damaging students and institutions know it and allow it to continue. So I agree, Angela. In some way, we should be able to standardize what is good and, and poor mentoring. I think it's also gonna take, I mean, we talked about leadership, you know, stepping up to say, okay, we're not, you know, I'm not expecting all of you to be great at teaching research and service. You can be a specialist in, in one, you know, just like at a Fortune 500 company, you might, you know, you never see everybody, you know, being a jack of all trades. Um, I think it is also going to take, though, not just strong leaders, it's going to take changing the mindset of faculty, because the faculty at most places own the tenure and promotion process. And, I can tell you, I worked for a very progressive provost that tried to encourage the deans and the department heads that, you know, hire great teachers and tenure them on that, hire great researchers, tenure them on that. 
And there was a lot of distrust in that, you know, that, well, this is what we've always known. Everybody has to have three parts to it. So it's going to take an overhaul of, you know, of the policies and that's going to have to happen, you know, very collaboratively, um, you know, in our, our system of shared governance. Thank you. Clearly, you tapped into an, an, an amazing issue, Ansley. Thank you so much for raising that question and congratulations to you. Thank you. I, I, I was granted five more minutes. <laughs> so um, we're going to get to these remaining three questions in those five minutes. Um, and I, I, I appreciate everybody's time. Wow, we could we could talk for hours. These, this is just such a, a great conversation. Joyce, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you so much. Um, Hello, everyone. I've um, really enjoyed being here with you. Um, I have a, a different question. So my work focuses on the other end of the spectrum of a STEM career, so not the student focus, but really focus at the faculty or um, just uh, at the edge of faculty careers and, and, and people who are pursuing faculty careers. And uh, it is also a population that they've clearly been successful. They have their PhD. They have secured these positions that are uh, hard to come by. And they are also still experiencing the same harms, just at a different variety, at a different career stage. And they also are still really um, in search of mentoring and support and community. And um, so I just wondered if uh, the panelists have anything to say about um, that particular space, you know, the, the professional space where you are also still encountering um, some of the same things that we see earlier. But people look at you and say, but you're a success, you've made it, you're in those positions. I think Dr. Barabino alluded to this in her opening remarks, and I'm wondering if she can start us off. Yeah, so what I found was helpful. It actually, I got started feeling so alone and like, how am I gonna navigate this? Was bringing people together uh, in networks, workshops, convenings, because you're, they're so few and so spread out. So bringing folks together, both for the networking, but also for the, for the professional development elements, um, because it, you've got to do something where you kind of say you're not by yourself and just checking in. So when you bring folks together who have that shared experience, one, it's just validation, like you're not crazy. Like, so that's one piece of it. But I think that there needs to be more of these kinds of collective gatherings, convening, sharing, and supporting. Because if you wait for it to happen at these different institutions, at that level by itself, it's not going to happen. Um, and so there's only so much you could do with grassroots too. But again, like some more intentional programming around that. There are people that I have, had, have like run workshops and they have come back to me later and say, that was so helpful. I'm so glad I did that workshop years ago. And many would come back again and again because part of it was that community that was built broader than what they were used to in their own institution. Thank you. Joyce, thank you for that great question and congratulations to you. Karen. Yeah, so Becky, you had mentioned um, mentoring frameworks and the danger of creating exclu ex exclusivity. And so I wanted to um, bridge that or, or tackle that thought a little bit more. I think you'd also mentioned um, looking at the essential functions of mentoring and how one could embed those in other ways. Um, really, I was just wondering, for people's thoughts, uh, you know, Becky, obviously, uh, starting with you, perhaps, um, because I think it, it is something that struck a chord with me, you know, because I and I think others tend to be focused on building the program, building the program. And I think perhaps that thought of exclusivity does have a lot to do with, you know, the issue that we have that there's this chasm now between the program and where our, our mentees are going once they leave the program. Yeah, I think um, just to extend just the tiny bit, you know, think of a metaphor, you know, I've used this in some trainings as we think of splash buckets, when you go to a water park, and you get a big, huge dump of water, you definitely cool off. And if you actually do a map of your campus, and you kind of look at all your splash buckets, you know, versus misting stations. So kind of like, you know, the sense of do we put all of our resources in one or two places, and are the students, or the faculty, for that matter, I would also say, I've learned that at some campuses, they have launch committees for new hires, 
but not everybody gets a launch committee or this kind of a thing. So if you want to think about what the resourcing is in terms of programming, or we put it for new, new hires, kind of get a, a group when they get launched, but not at mid-career or not at, right, when people become chairs, they're supposed to automatically know how to mentor their colleagues. Um, th these are things that I think um, programs have their place, but rarely do we learn from them in ways that we can extend to the broader system and say, what are we learning that's working here that might work somewhere else or needs to be modified and added? Is there a cost-effective way to embed an essential function? You know, so um, just an example, many campuses have a first-year seminar program or something like that. That could be a great place to attach a peer mentor system, you know, into that because students are already there. So it's kind of looking for places that are already embedded versus kind of optional, opt-in or exclusive. So again, it's not that to get rid of them by any stretch, but to really say, are we use, are, do we see them as the end or do we see them as the beginning? Do we see them as part of a broader system? And that's what I'd push for. Thank you. Great question, Karen, and congratulations to you. Marcus, over to you. Well, thank you. Uh, can you all hear me? All right. It seems like I'm always the last one between um, getting uh, everything going away. And uh, so I'm going to make this quick. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for this honor. Uh, Jim has been doing a lot of work um, over the uh, last 45 years of his history. But I have a question for the panel. Uh, because you have such wealth of knowledge, if I were to write a letter, or if you were to write a letter back to your younger self and you were starting your mentoring program today, what would you do differently so that you could touch more lives and do more of the things today now that you have this wealth of knowledge, if you could go back in time? So um, I know that's a doozy. I don't know if you can answer it in five minutes, but please do. Thank you. <laughs> what a question, I love it. <laughs> Who's going to be brave enough to, uh, <laughs> to try to answer first? I have an example. I, I think we don't do a good job of integrating what we do. And so like we have like the K-12 space or pre-K-12, then we've got the college pre, I mean the college space, and then we got, you know, post-college, you know, but we don't integrate it sufficiently. We don't make those connections. So if I was going to do something, I'd take Calvin's program and I would say, integrate that with what's happening at the college level and not have the college level just be a partner to say, let's do outreach. I would say, no, let's partner and learn from one another how we teach at the college level. Like we can learn on how they're do learn kind of activities that work for young people, work for the older people too. And if you were integrating that and you were learning in that kind of model, that would be much more exciting than everybody working separately, or even when they partner, they're not partnering in a way that is truly integrated. So that's what I would do. And to add on to that, uh, one of the things I kind of wanted to bring up from what I even see from this middle school, high school perspective of what people are actually doing with STEM, STEM has become a really interesting buzzword in education where people are just doing these concepts. They're like, we're doing STEM, we're doing STEM, but they're not truly integrating STEM concepts. Right. Um, so I think this is exactly an opportunity for the professionals who are really um, versed in STEM activities and the type of programming that the kids should be exposed to, um, to really step in and connect on that level so that there isn't this misconception of what STEM really is. Because I, you know, I've had students who looked at something that was flashy online and they were like, Mr. Bernard, and that's not STEM. I was like, I know, buddy, just, <laughs> just, you know, bear with it. But there's a lot of misinformation in the STEM area. And I think it's really important that um, we address that before it creates um, a lot of misconceptions on the um, tail end. Well, thank you, Marcus, for that thought-provoking question. Um, what a great one to, to end our session today and congratulations to you. I would like to thank our distinguished panelists and to all of you who have participated in this discussion for these amazing inquisitive questions and your great contributions. I know that I have learned a lot just from the short time 
being here with all of you. It has just been truly an honor to, to be here in all of your presence today. Um, and sorry. Um, and I would like to extend one last congratulations to all the awardees, your perseverance, your commitment to STEM, and everything that you do to ensure equity and diversity throughout the STEM sector will continue to transform the scientific landscape into one that is more equitable and capable of extraordinary ideas. I know that, that just being here today with all of you, I really feel like we can change the world together. So I want to thank you all, and I would like to turn the floor over to Dr. Nafisa Owens for closing remarks. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, again, it is my honor and privilege to close today's um, event. Um, first, again, please let me uh, start off by congratulating our newest presidential awardees. As a former program director at the National Science Foundation, someone who has directed this program at one point, uh, please know how near and dear this program is to me. Uh, the work that you do, the impact that you make, it does not go unnoticed. It has not gone unnoticed to me, to OSTP, to NSF, um, to all of those who have given you your congratulations, well-deserved, um, and especially to those that you serve. It does not go unnoticed to them. I would not be where I am today if not for the amazing individuals, programs, and opportunities afforded to me, if not because of my mentors. Extraordinary men and women who believed in me even when I did not believe in myself. And I'm not talking about 20, 40 years ago. Um, sometimes those doubts can be very current and real and relevant. And yet I have mentors who encourage me every day along the way. I am so grateful that OSTP and NSF has this program to honor and thank you for your exceptional mentorship. I would also like to thank all of our presenters and panelists, each of them inspirational. We appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules to join us today, to join this important discussion around access to information, to the importance of dissemination, to the critical steps needed to support implementation and how we can better support scaling of evidence-based practices that support not only better mentoring, but better STEM equity in general. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the exceptional members who carried out the program and the events for today, the Excellence Awards in Science and Technology team at NSF, the support team at Booz Allen, as well as the teams at OSTP, the STEM awards team, the STEM equity team, and other treasured colleagues within the Science and Society division. Now, before we go, there are just two quick things that I would like to share. Uh, one, that OSTP also oversees a suite of presidential awards. So if you know of any outstanding scientists, mathematicians, or engineers, and I know you do, uh, please consider nominating them for a Medal of Science or a Medal of Technology and Innovation um, as nominations just recently opened. I would also like to mention um, that maybe you may or may not know, but from October 2020 to now, NSF's Directorate for Education and Human Resources has invested over $330 million in over 340 awards that address mentors, mentorship, and or mentoring in some sort, form, or fashion. And many of those awards going directly to support students through scholarship. And that's just NSF. We know there are many other federal science agencies are committed to supporting STEM mentorship, as well as STEM equity, diversity, inclusion, and accessibility. A quick look at the Committee on STEM Education's recent report on best practices for diversity and inclusion in STEM education and research definitely speaks to that, which is why I'm also so happy to say OSTP and NSF are launching a webinar series with the same name as today's symposium, Models of Equitable STEM Excellence, to continue to share emerging, promising, and evidence-based exemplars that support mentoring and STEM equity. And with that, again, I want to thank you all 
for joining us today. Again, congratulations to our presidential awardees and everyone who took time to join us, even those who are joining us today on YouTube. We, always, we hope you have found this just as inspirational as I have. So again, I look forward to seeing some of you again, perhaps when OSTP and NSF celebrate our presidential awards for STEM teaching later on this month. For today, again, our awardees, please stay on as we continue to build our community here. But the others, again, have an amazing day. Goodbye, and thank you so much again for joining us.